You might have heard it said, maybe you've said yourself, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I, I've trusted Jesus, but, but the church isn't something that I want to participate in. Or church for me is a cup of coffee on the patio on a Saturday morning, Sunday morning. Or church for me is a gathering of friends with a meal. What is the church? Is it, is it this out of fashion thing that really we ought to just dispense with? Because who really needs this thing, this abacus of religious life, this pager, this fax machine, kind of a relic of a time gone by? What is the church? That's what we want to explore over the next five weeks. What is the church? What is God's purpose for the church? What is, what is his invitation to you when it comes to the church? And what does the church need from you? How, how have you been made to bless the church? Now, before we get anywhere, as soon as I say the word the church, you might be thinking about a building somewhere. When we talk about the church, we're talking about the people of God. The followers of Jesus Christ gathered together, and, and that spans every Every tribe, tongue, and nation, it spans all of history. That's the church, the church. We are the church. We're a local gathering, a manifestation of that universal reality. We're going to explore the church. As as scripture talks about the church, we hear that the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. We hear that church is, is a gathering. We hear that the church is to be on mission together. And today we're going to talk about the church as the body of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. Now, depending on how you hear those words is is a likely indicator of, of how long you've been around this Christian thing. Now, if you've been a Christian for a long time, you're going to hear those words. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. You're like, yeah, yeah, no big deal. And if you're not a Christian or or you're a new Christian, you're going to hear the church is the body of Jesus Christ? And actually, you are closer to the truth than those people who've been kind of immunized to it. It's weird. It's weird that we would talk about a collection of people as the body of a man who lived 2,000 years ago. That's odd. Why in the world would Scripture talk about it that way? Because when we talk about the body of Jesus Christ, what we mean is that the people of God are intended to reflect the glory of Jesus Christ to the world around us. Let me say that again. The people of God, as the body of Jesus Christ, are intended to reflect his glory to the world around us. I want to start in a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians where he talks about that very thing. Now, what's interesting about this passage is that he's not going to start there at all. In fact, you're going to be like, where is this going? He's going to talk about his gratitude for the, the followers of Jesus Christ in Ephesus. Then he's going to, then he's going to pray a prayer for them, an awesome prayer. A prayer I, I would bet every one of us, even those who aren't yet Christians, would say, like, I, I want some of that. And then he's going to lift his eyes and he's going to see Jesus Christ and reflect on him. And then he's going to turn to the church. So let's go to that prayer in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Saints is just a follower of Jesus Christ. Because I've heard of of how much you love Jesus and you love his people, he's going to pray this prayer for them. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. Now that's 
an amazing prayer. An amazing prayer. A prayer I, I want to encourage you to pray for yourself, to pray for those you love. I mean, you see what he's praying for here? He, he prays for wisdom for them. For revelation that their hearts would be open to spiritual truths. He prays that they would, they would be filled with hope. He prays that they would experience what he calls the riches of the glorious inheritance of the saints. In other words, like all of the spiritual blessings that, that Jesus has intended for us. And then, he, and then he prays that they would have power, the power of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I would, I would bet that everyone in this room, if I said, hey, do you want those things? Do you want wisdom, wisdom enlightenment? Do you want hope? Do you want power? Like, we're all like, yeah, give me a double portion of that. We, we all long for these things. And then he's going to say, but who gives those things? Who gives those things is Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. He goes on. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but the one to come. So he says, all of those things are yours, are available to you through Jesus Christ, who came and lived in the flesh and died on the cross. And, and our picture of him might in there, but Paul actually now wants us to, to see the resurrected Jesus, the overcomer of death, the overcomer of sin. And he says, he's the one, Jesus Christ, who reigns at the right hand of God Almighty, God the Father Almighty today. He's the one who gives all of these blessings. Okay, so a prayer, a spiritual prayer for all of us, saying where that comes from, Jesus Christ, and now he turns to the church. Why would he turn there? It's kind of like, it seems like, just put a period, Paul, you're good. But here's what he actually says. And he put, that's God the Father, he put all things under his feet, that's Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, the people of God, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So he begins with this like magisterial prayer that you're going to experience all of these spiritual blessings in your life. And they're coming from Jesus. And oh, by the way, Jesus, Jesus is the head of his body, the church. Who? What, what does he say? He says, did you catch what he said there? Who is the fullness of him who fills all in all. In other words, the church is a manifestation of of the attributes, of the glory of Jesus Christ, of his compassion, of his mercy, of his wisdom, of his power, of the very things that he was praying up front. The people of God are intended to be a manifestation of Jesus Christ in this earth. That's a wild thing. It's a wild prayer. We are the fullness of Jesus Christ who fills all in all. The picture that, that comes to my mind, I've never seen this in person. I'd love to see this one day in person. This would be pretty fun. I've, you know, I've seen it in movies, probably like the, the rest of us. Like, have you ever seen those, those scenes, like the, the, you know, the, the fancy schmancy get together, whatever, and there's like the tier, the pyramid of uh, champagne glasses. You've seen this, right? And they pour the champagne on the top glass and it f funnels down, it fills the top. And with everyone it fills, they fill the ones underneath it, right? And then it spills out over. This is, we are the glasses. Jesus Christ is the champagne who's filling us, over filling us. As we are filled up with him, we drench the world. We fill the world. We overflow his grace, his goodness, his character to the world. That's what he's intended for us. What a wild thing. And not us individually, although that's, there's a truth in that, but but in this text, he's specifically saying that it's a context of the people of God, the church, the wholeness of the body of Jesus Christ does this. Let me, let me get to it another way. Why is it that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came, 
lived with us, died for us, rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven. Why didn't he just do a U-turn and come back down? He proved it, right? I died for your sins. I rose again for your sins. Like, wouldn't it be an effective way to like demonstrate who he is if he's just like floating in the air? Or maybe he's like down with us, like in his, you know, the Pope is a Pope mobile. So Jesus would have a Jesus mobile, right? And you're like, Jesus is coming to town this week, right? Like that'd be pretty effective. He chose not to do that. What did he choose to do instead? Jesus, the head, gave the world his body, us. He intended for us to be a demonstration of his character, for us, through the Spirit of God, collectively to demonstrate his glory on this earth. Holy moly, is that a high calling or what? It's amazing. I think of... uh, these little dolls called My Hero Dolls. I don't know if you've ever heard of these. I bet some of our military folks know My Hero Dolls. My Hero Dolls are created for the children of deployed um, military personnel. So, and I'll show, I'll show one here. Here's, here's a My Hero Doll. They make them all different types and they're intended to look like mom or dad. In fact, some of them have little, you know, voice chips like some of those dolls do with dad, you know, dad maybe saying a prayer or how much he loves you or mom speaking over you. Like, what an amazing thing that is, right? And so you see these kids who are clutching the My Hero dolls as mom, as dad, or deployed away from them. The doll is meant to be a manifestation of the character, of the love, of the compassion of God in this world. This is what the body of Christ is intended to be. We... We get to be my hero doll for Jesus in this world. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that that beautiful? Isn't that powerful? That we get to display Jesus to this world. I mean, you can hardly imagine a more significant purpose That Jesus chose not to be here and instead chose to have us demonstrate who he is on this earth. This, um, so today I was was headed out to uh, my gate post before the first service. And and as I was was doing that, I got a tap on the shoulder. And then as I was turning around before I could do anything else, I got a tight hug from somebody who said, happy pastor's appreciation day. What a kind thing. I I cannot touch Jesus. You can't touch Jesus today, but you can touch his body. Jesus can't give you a hug today, but his body can give you a hug today. His body can pray with you, demonstrate kindness to you, have mercy to you. Jesus has given us his church, the body. Now, I want to navigate a few different passages that reflect the way in which Jesus has intended for his body to demonstrate his glory to the world. We're going to talk about how how he intends for his body to demonstrate his glory to the world through the way that we honor each other, through our unity with one another, through the way in which we give our our gifting to one another. We're going to talk about the, the way in which he's intended that through the way we love each other, And finally, through the way that he's changing us through the gift of one another. So let me, let's let's go through a few passages and talk about this. I'm going to begin over in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul is reflecting on our purpose as the body in terms of the way that we honor each other is how he's going to begin this text. 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So he he reflects with just this very basic thing. Hey, listen, like you need your whole body to be you. You're, you know, you didn't come to church this, you know, church this morning and like your toe walked in and that was it, right? Hopefully all of you came, right? Well, there goes that. Um, like you, you bring all of yourself. You need your whole body 
He's like, hey, that's the same way with the church. We need, we need each other. We need all of who we are. Now, this is important because what Paul is doing, he's using a very common metaphor by Rome that was used for a purpose, and he's flipping it on its head for a very different purpose. Okay, so Rome loved this idea that, that Romans were part of the body, right? Rome, Rome is the body, and you have to protect the body. Now, the way that Romans used this was to say, and you know you're really insignificant. You're the appendix, right? Like, you're the part of the body we can do away with. But... Your purpose is to help make sure the whole thing functions together. So sacrifice yourself for the important members of the body, the important pieces of the body, and we'll all be good, right? Okay to lose a limb as long as you don't get your head cut off, right? So sacrifice yourself. This is the way Rome used this. Paul uses it the exact opposite way. Paul's like, well, this is not how it works in the body of Christ. You all are important. You all are to be honored and valued and cared for. And the whole purpose of the body is that every member is important. Every member is supposed to esteem and honor and protect and care for one another. There's not invaluable members as part of the body. You're all to be valued and cared for. It's a beautiful thing. It also connects to our culture today, does it not? Like we live in a platform type culture. I follow this leader. I am, you know, I, this is someone who's influenced in my life. I'm on this team. I'm on this. And, and it's as though the leaders, the talking heads, the personalities become more important than, well, than the rest. And that is just not true. This is not the church of John and Greg. We are of no more importance than any other member here. We collectively are the body of Christ who ought to honor each other and care for each other and esteem each other. Yesterday, we had an opportunity as our uh, connection group to, to care for somebody in the church who needed some help. And so we were over there helping out. It was super fun. It was really fun to kind of like watch other people like in their elements. So we have like multiple handy guys in our group and I am not one of those guys. So like we're in this context and I'm like, I like, I'm the bottom, of, I'm like the, the bottom of the pecking order. Like you guys tell me what to do. Like we got chainsaws out, we got trucks, we got toe straps, like, you know, stuff. And I'm like, stuff I don't know about. So you guys who are gifted in this, you tell me what to do. And this is, this is the beauty of the body of Christ. Depending on the context, depending on the function of the church, and the church has so many different functions, functions of care of kids, functions of outreach, functions in terms of the support of neighborhoods, functions in terms of the evangelistic witness of the church, functions in terms of, of of just what it looks like to, to build one another up, to serve one another. And every one of us has a different role in those different things. And so, yeah, on a, on a Sunday morning, in a context of preaching or teaching, I have a certain function that, that all of a sudden looks elevated, but I don't look very elevated. You know, last, last week, I, I had the angel and I were down in the children's wing, which was awesome, and you get to see things doing there. And we're like the helpers. We're just... We're just Adult hands in the room, right? Like, we're not leading it. What a gift it is to be serving and honor and esteem the different members of the body. There's a, a show, I'm dating myself a little bit here. Anybody know the Adams family, the show? Okay, yeah. All right, so the show, if, if you don't know the show, there's, it's, it's a kind of a perfect October show. It's kind of like this odd family, right? And there's this character in the show called The Thing. Remember The Thing? It's this hand. I'll show, I'll show us The Thing. There's the, there's the Thing, right? A disembodied hand. And the whole purpose of The Thing was like, that's weird. Like, it's not, it, like, it's, a, it's supposed to be like a person, but not a person in the show. And, and that's the very reality. That's not what a person looks like. But for many of us, we we think of the church that way as though like there's this like 
there's the thing in the church that we ought to be like, that's what it ought to look like. And Paul is like, no, the body is the body. We need all the parts and all ought to be honored. Paul, Paul continues over in verse 13. And now he's going to speak of the way in which the unity of the church displays the glory of Jesus Christ. Verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Hey, so if you are in Jesus Christ, you have been filled with the spirit of God. You have entrusted yourself to Jesus. The spirit of God has now filled you and you've been baptized, not just into Christ, but into his family. You might hear this as we do baptisms. If, if, you, if you come to new life, we ask some questions. Have you put your trust in Christ? Are you committed to live a life that demonstrates Jesus Christ? And then the third one, are you committed to his church? And we're not asking, are you committed to new life? We're asking, hey, part of an essential part of your baptism is that I am all in with Christ, which means I'm all in with his family. I'm all in with his church. It's part of my walk. And that's what, That's what Paul is saying here. Part of the glory of the church is the unity that God brings in and through us. Part of the the beautiful thing, you might have just skipped right over that text. It said there in verse 13, for in one spirit we were all baptized in one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free. Like he takes the two biggest divisions in the world of that time. Slaves and free, and Jews and Greek. And believe it or not, Jews and Greek is a bitter, bigger distinction at that time than even slaves or free. And it's bigger, I would argue, actually than any division we have in our culture today. Socioeconomic, political, ethnic. It's massive. And he says, part of the glory of Jesus Christ in you is that he has made you who are different to be one different personalities, different backgrounds, different sport team rooting interests, different interests altogether, different hobbies altogether, different political allegiances, different ethnic backgrounds. And I have made you to be one. And that, of course, is is ultimately true in the context of the universal church, for sure, but he also intends it to be manifest here too in a local level. We ought to be a place that you look over across the aisle and you're like, I would not hang out with these people. And that's a good thing. What a glory it is to come to a people that aren't people like, like the Elks Club or whatever, you know, your neighborhood party. Like to come to a group of people that God has put together in his glory for his purposes to demonstrate unity that he has for us. What a beautiful thing that is. Jesus demonstrates his glory through our unity. And this is also why, by the way, you hear this a lot in the context of millennials, Gen Z, who are like, hey, church for me, I said this up front, church for me is, is when I hang out with my, with my group of friends, right? I'm like, hey, it's good to hang out with your group of friends, but Christ chooses who's in the church, We don't. And part of the glory of gathering together in local bodies like this is that they're not people you would choose. There's a goodness in that. There's a reflection of the heart of Jesus, open, invitational, calling us together. Jesus is also glorified through us as we serve one another with our gifts. I'm gonna bump back up to verse seven here. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. If you are in Jesus Christ, you have the spirit of God within you and the spirit of God has given you gifts. Given you gifts. I don't know what those gifts are. They're all sorts of different gifts. I mean, you like, you look in, the room today and just even just in this service, you have those with the capacity to mix music. I can't even turn on the lights in this room. I can't tell you how many times people are, hey, pastor, can you turn the lights? I don't know. 
I, I, I don't have the capacity to do such things, right? You have musicians with, like, I can't play an instrument. You have people who are serving our kids with hearts that just are passionate for, for kids. You'll have a room full of teenagers here tonight for student ministries with, with those serving, absolutely, with serving those students with a heart for those students. You have those who are reaching into the foster community, those who are reaching into, into the community of those who are struggling with, with uh, homelessness. You have, you have those who are reaching out to all sorts of giftings. It's a glorious thing. And it ought to be that we have different gifts. And those gifts aren't for us. My gifts aren't for me. Your gifts aren't for you. They're for us. The gifts the Spirit of God has given you are for those around you. Now, this is radically countercultural today, and it was radically countercultural there. In fact, like, you know, you could pick up the Bible and, and read Ephesians and Corinthians. You're like, what does a 2,000-year-old letter have to do with me? I'd actually argue, Ephesus and Corinth are like very contemporary towns. Very, if I can use this word, it's, you know, it's a word for today, but they're very secular towns. They're international places of commerce and trade where all sorts of different worldviews and religions are packed in. And people were consumers. They were totally cool. Like, I'm going to go to that temple because they have the best preacher. I'm going to go to that temple because they have the best buffets. I'm going to that temple because, well, the, the prostitutes are best at that temple. I'm being serious. Like, I'm going to take what is going to feed me. And Paul says, that is not the way the body of Christ, the church, is intended to work. You are meant to be a giver. You're blessed to be a blessing. One of our values here at New Life, you'll hear us say, is that we are contributors, not consumers. You have been formed with a contribution to make, with not just, not just something to take, not just a place to come where you, you like the music and you think that the preaching is okay and either you know, the donuts are pretty good and the coffee is great. You know, like, no, no. You come to, because you have blessings, you have gifts to give. This is the intention of the body of Christ. And it's glorious when it's, when it's in action. It's so glorious. Like, I don't, like, if, if you've been coming to New Life over the past few months, you've seen a couple of, of baptisms that we've done here. About 25 were baptized. A bunch of those were students. And I think one of the most beautiful things in those baptisms was watching students choose their leaders to baptize them. They're like, who's the most important spiritual influence in my life? It's this leader. It's this person who's, who's serving me, who demonstrates a care for me, who's showing up every Sunday night, who's taking me to coffee, who's, who's going to camp with. I want them to participate. And I would say that is the body of Christ. That's the body of Christ. A manifestation of the glory of God at work. I want to continue. We have two more ways the glory of God is meant to be demonstrated. Next is over in John. It's through our love for one another. In John 13, right before Jesus is about to be crucified, he's telling his disciples how to prepare for life to come after the crucifixion. And he says this over in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, if you're a disciple like that, that would have been like the most sorely disappointing thing you'd ever heard. A new commandment. Oh, I've been with you for three years, Jesus. Let me take out my pen, right? Love one another. That's not original stuff, Jesus. Like that's like, that's like back to like, the Ten Commandments kind of stuff. Love one another. What are you talking about? Here is why Jesus says it's a new commandment. He continues, love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. How is this commandment new? It's new because it's in the shape of Jesus. I have demonstrated to you how to love one another. 
And this is what my love looks like. It's not trite. It's not easy. It's no small thing. It persists. It's humble. It's kind. It bears burdens. This, this is my love. By this, verse 35, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know how I'm going to show my glory to the world? You know how I'm going to prove who I am? You know how, you know how I'm going to prove to the world that I actually love them? It's through your love for one another. I mean, that's a massive thing. A massive thing. That can't be done alone. It cannot be done alone. It's not by your individual love. It's your love for one another. It's that you show up and you love those who are different than you. You love those who are difficult. You lean in to those who are suffering. You love one another. This is the glory of Christ. Finally, let's turn over to Romans where, where Paul makes this argument. It's an odd argument. It's a very un-American argument. He's going to argue that for us to look more like him and thus glorify him in the world, like we can, we can say that, right? Like, like we acknowledge, A, we want to look more like Jesus and B, the more we look more like Jesus, the more he's glorified, right? Like we certainly get that on the opposite side, right? Like when John is sinful and selfish and proud and egotistical, like Oh, man, what a repellent that is. But the more we look like Christ, the more his glory is reflected, the more he's honored in the world. So listen, listen to what Paul says. Now, if you grew up in the church, you're, you're going to recognize the beginning of this passage, but my hunch is it got cut off at a certain place. The ending is going to surprise you. Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, do you want to be all in? Do you want to follow Jesus? You, you, you can't keep him at hand's length, arm's length. You can't keep him out there. You have to be all in. You can't give him 10% of yourself. You can't give him your arm. You need to give him all of you. Put yourself on the altar and give yourself to God. He continues, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Hey, as you give yourself to me and are transformed, your heart is going to be changed. You are gonna start swimming upstream in a downstream world. You're going to think differently than this world. You're going to look differently than, differently than this world. You're going to have different priorities in this world. Like, we all get that, right? Up to this point, though, it, it almost seems like you could do this on your own. And this is where many sermons end on this passage. But Paul actually tells us that the church is essential in this work that God has for us. He's going to say, hey, listen, if you want to be all in with Jesus, you have to be all in. You have to give yourself to Jesus. All in. Living sacrifice. But then he's going to say, and Jesus is going to give you to the church for that work to be done in you. Listen to what he says. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of the faith that God has assigned. Like, we get this. The most common complaint against the church today is that we are hypocrites. And we are. We're sinners saved by grace. And there's no promise that within the church, within us as Christians, we will, sin will be removed. Now, the work of the Spirit of God within us will be helping us to look more and more like Jesus as we live, if the Spirit is alive in us. And also the church will be helping us to look more and more like him. Less selfish, less egotistical. He continues. For 
As in one body, we have many members and the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. In other words, if you want to look like Jesus, you have to participate in the body that Jesus has made to help you look more like him. It's part of his calling. It's part of his purpose for each and every one of us. Jesus has intended for us to demonstrate his glory to this world. To demonstrate his glory to this world. And he does so through his body. So, what do we do with this? Let me invite us to two applications. First, We need to repent. We need to repent for the way that we've diminished the body of Jesus Christ. Like, we are Westerners at heart. We are individualistic. We are independent. We think about this in all sorts of ways, and we think about this in terms of our spirituality. It's just the waters that we swim in. And for most of us, We have lived lives in which we have diminished God's purpose for the body of Christ in our spirituality. And so we need to repent. God, I'm sorry that I've I've thought that I had a better way than you. I'm sorry that I, I thought that I could go this walk alone. I'm sorry that I thought that I could make myself look more like you without the means and the invitation that you've called me to. Forgive me. Forgive me. Repent. Second, discern. What are your gifts and what's God's call for you in this, his body? What purposes does God have for you? What are the gifts that he's given for you? I wanna, I wanna take you behind the curtain a little bit, bit here at New Life. So every week, we invite you to go to our next step table out on the patio. And we do so because we genuinely want to get to know you. We don't want, an, we don't want to be anonymous here at New Life. We want, to, we want to connect with one another. And every person who goes to first step is going to be invited to next steps. And next steps is going to be a more uh, like a longer gathering where you're going to get to know other people. You're going to leave there, I promise. You're going to have some new friends. You're going to get to understand a little bit more about New Life, and we're going to get to know you a little bit better. And then after next steps, we have Unwrapped, which navigates this very question. What are your gifts? What are you made for? What are God's purposes for you? You, If you're a Christian and you've been to church, you might have been at churches that kind of like pound the the Bible, pound the whatever, podium, and like, we have to have volunteers here. And like, there's like, there's danger in that, right? You don't want people who are like, I hate kids, but I guess that they need somebody back there, you know? Please know, <laughs> God has made you for something, but let's not put you there, right? And so that's, that's the thing. If we're all serving, there'll be, no, there'll be no needs. There's abundance of care. And God has purposed you in a way in which your heart beats faster for something. I don't know what that is. He's made teachers. He's made He's made those with a heart for for the lost. He's made those with hearts for outreach. He's he's made those whose hearts beat to make this the most hospitable, friendly, welcoming place you walk into all week. I mean, we've all had experience, right? Where you walk into church and you're like, I don't know if anybody even wants me here. Like, this is awkward. Like, our first impressions team is not the JV team of service here. Y'all are going to experience new life like way before you experience me. You're going to experience them and it's going to feel like they want me here or they not. They don't. Who, who doesn't think the way in which we care for our kids is important? I mean, on and on and on it goes. Who doesn't think the way in which we care for those who are the least of us in our community matters? Minister to those who needs the outreach 
impact of this church doesn't matter. You've been given gifts. So what are the ways that God has called you? And I'll just, so, so I'll tell you right now. November 9th is our next next steps if you haven't done it. If you, you might have been here for years and you're like, that's gonna be so awkward. It's okay. I promise you, you won't be the only one who's been here for years who's like finally, okay, fine, I'll go. November 9th. November 23rd is unwrapped. You can talk to the folks out on the patio at First Step. They'll have more information. God has purposes for us to serve, to be a reflection of his glory on this earth. What a responsibility that is. What a gift that is. I want to close us where I began over in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says this. And he, God the Father, put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Church, you are meant to be the glory of Jesus Christ in this earth. So let's demonstrate his glory in our compassion, in our wisdom, in our service, in our honoring, in our unity, in our love, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the gift of us, the gift of this body. Thank you, Lord, for your purposes for us. And I just pray, Lord, for our hearts to be set on you, to be led by you, to we would demonstrate just how glorious you are in this world that so desperately needs you. In your name we pray.